Welcome back to the second episode of the biochemistry course and in this video I will explain What? Please give me one second Hello manager Hey Did you watch my last episode? No, no, no I am not here to ask time I will ask you only one question Is it possible to build a structure mm. without putting a foundation? Mm. Of course not Then put it <laughs> If you don't mind Roger that if this is your first time here and you are interested in academic content, start by writing, uh, I mean subscribing to this channel so you don't get lost in the homepage jam. In this video, we will mention 5 crucial key concepts essential for anyone who is learning biochem. The first thing that causes many confusions for learners is the arrows, and we'll use the dissociation of water into ions as an illustration. The first arrow signifies that this reaction is irreversible and the ions cannot combine anymore to form a water molecule. The second arrow, it's two arrows actually that are opposite to each other and this signifies that the reaction is reversible and can proceed in either direction and the ions can reform the water. The third arrow is just like the second one except that each arrow is halved. And this signifies that the reaction is reversible plus it reached the equilibrium state. The fourth arrow is just like the third one except that the arrow heading towards the ions is significantly longer than the opposite one, meaning that this reaction at the equilibrium state will tend to have more ions present than water molecules. Finally, the fifth arrow. The arrow heading toward the water molecules is longer than the opposite one, and this is the reality that truly exists inside this cup of water. The second crucial thing that worth mentioning is the chemical bonds. We have to know that the strength of chemical bonds change when the surrounding medium change. In other words, the ionic bond is an extremely strong one. Unless you put it in an aqueous medium, immediately it dissociates and the ions get separated. Unlike the covalent bond that can maintain its bonding strength and structure. Whether it's inside or outside an aqueous solvent, by other means, you will never find carbon crystals that precipitated in the bottom of a cup or oxygen molecules exiting the water as a gas. The third crucial thing that we have is the isomers. Those two compounds have the same molecular and geometrical structure, but only differ in proton binding locations. And instead of bonding with oxygen, it made a coordinated bond with nitrogen. Those two compounds are called isomers, but in this case, that the proton can be transferred in a reversible process, they became totomers. A big warning sign, not all isomers can become totomers. As the following example, the C double bond O cannot be broken to transfer the oxygen from place to the other. The only thing that is able to be transferred is the proton only. The fourth crucial thing that upsets the driver, uh, I mean the learner, is the symbols. Many Greek symbols are used in carbon counting. It can describe the relative position between atoms. So how can I use them? The reference atom takes the number 1, and the next one will take alpha, and then beta. Or wait, I have a better idea than just drawing them. If we imagined this trip as a carbon skeleton, and we chose the first capsule to be the reference atom, the first directly connected capsule to it will take the letter alpha, and the next one will take the letter beta. But what for with the one below the number one atom? It will be assigned as alpha and the next one will have a beta. In conclusion, the direction has no influence on the nomenclature and you can have two to three to four alpha atoms. Of course, if you are working on carbon. Is it crystal clear? Can I take a capsule then? And there is a cup of tea and salt. Oh God, mixing ionic and covalent resulted in an awful taste. There are other symbols used as an abbreviation for chemical compounds, such as the P, which is used as a shorthand to represent the phosphate group that is bound to an organic molecule. And this P is mistakenly understood as the elemental phosphorus. No, it is not. And there is the PI that is also used for the phosphate group. However, it's bound only to a hydrogen atom instead of an organic molecule. The X is used for halogens, such as fluoride and chloride. The B is used for bases or any element that has at least one lone pair of electrons that can steal a proton from the medium. The R is used as shorthand to represent the rest of whatever is the side chain. 
It functions just as etc in English. Now we have reached the fifth and final crucial thing in this station, which is the numbers. Everyone knows what's a monomer, and everyone knows what's a polymer. However, there is a strong debate on the one in between, the oligomer. The oligo has three cases. In nucleotides, it ranges from 8 to 50 units. In saccharides, it ranges from 3 to 10, and in other references, from 2 to 10 units. In peptides, its chain is shorter than 20 amino acids. We all know the di and trite prefixes, but did you hear before the prefix bis and tris, and you wondered, is there a difference? I will use the compound fructose 1,6-bisphosphate as an example. The two phosphate groups acquired the prefix bis instead of di, because they are separated by more than one atom. Unlike the ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which has the two phosphate groups directly connected to each other. So what is the prefix tris? It's the same idea previously mentioned. We all know the fancy buffer called tris that is usually combined with edita making tris edita because it had three hydroxyl groups far away from each other. And now it's time for bonus section. Before anyone close the video you need to know how useful the energy diagram can be. At certain time we all wondered why the ADP molecule gains another phosphate group although it will make it less stable and higher in energy. A simple analogy for it is by imagining that the second phosphate has a spring and a hook, and the third phosphate is waiting there as an inorganic phosphate. So the ADP is a low energy state. In the high energy state we try to imagine how the third phosphate reached the second one. The phosphate was pushing the spring for a certain distance, till the hook fell down and locked the phosphate in its new position. Returning back to the diagram, this increase in energy is the work exerted to overcome the spring barrier. And for the sudden fall of energy is when the hook fell down, the spring relaxed a little bit. But what this peak signifies in the chemical reaction? It's called the transition state, which is the highest point in energy through a reaction. And it's the real cause for the relative stability of ATP. Now it's time to have the question of the video. Can you tell the difference between the phenol totomerism and the phenol uh, resonance? We are waiting for your answers in the comments below. I am Radwan Durbala and you crammed on the road. <laughs>